Welcome to Mastara, where I am running a day late because my party was almost to the end of finishing the Lost City and they wanted to get an early start before they face Zargon. And CenturyLink really screwed up the internet uh, this weekend, so mostly that reason. But I'm back on schedule and this week we are looking at the first attempt to introduce Mastara into the multiverse with Mastara Space. This wasn't exactly easy because while Mastara is known for continuity errors, Spelljammer is known for the setting that wasn't really well defined but I'm going to make a septagonal peg fit into a trapezoidal hole. I'm Mr. Welch, and we're looking at Mastara Space. The resources on Mastara Space are sparse, to put it mildly. Mastara was part of the Beckme rules, while Spelljammer was built using the 2nd edition rules. When Spelljammer rolled out, it only talked about the Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Dragonlance. Mastara was retconned into the setting later, along with the other settings that hadn't been created yet, even though Spelljammer died out before Mastara was converted to 2nd edition. So almost everything Mastara Space has was taken from existing sources and made to fit into the Crystal Spheres mechanics of Spelljammer. Notice I said almost, and we're going to talk about the 500,000 ton beagle in the room later. One unique aspect to Mastara Space is that, unlike the other spheres, the Mastara Sphere is quite hostile to life. Normally a ship takes its own air bubble through space and the temperature is constant. Well, Mastara is having none of that, with the void of Mastara space leaching the air from the ship quickly. Because of this, ships traversing Mastara space need to have an enclosed air supply or use powerful magic to create or supply air rather than relying on taking it with you. In addition, Mastara space is quite cold, 30 to 50 degrees below freezing on average. So again, ships will have to bring their own heat supply or the crews will quickly freeze. Mastara really doesn't like unannounced visitors if you haven't noticed. Most of the information on Mastara Space comes from the modules Twilight Calling and Tree of Life. As they were written by different authors and contradict each other, they're almost impossible to resolve, but I'm going to try. There's eight planets in the Mastara system, each with a real-world equivalent, with two missing planets and one additional planet. There is no equivalent of Mercury or Pluto. In addition, there's a planet called Damocles, where our asteroid belt would be. First up is Valerius, as all the planets are named after immortals. This is a green and verdant planet filled with jungles and all sorts of beasts. Passions run wild in Valerius, and the creatures that reside there tend to act on their first impulse. There is a large amount of animal life of all kinds, both magical and mundane, along with various sylvan creatures and a large number of elves. The planet has the effect on those residing there to lose inhibitions, and also makes it difficult to think of long-term goals in lieu of instant gratification. Skipping over the planet of Mastara proper, you come to the third planet, which has a dual name, either Rathanos or Vanya. This, of course, is the equivalent of Mars, and it's colored by blood, not rust, in this setting. It's a world of constant struggle, with countless troops engaged in any number of wars. Everything is settled with violence on this planet, either small brawls or full-scale wars. That's the legacy of Rathanos. The effect of Vanya on the planet is that throwing troops away needlessly is abhorred. She brings tactics and strategy to the violence, bringing some sort of order to an otherwise mad battleground. Kronos represents Jupiter, though it is a terrestrial planet instead of a gas giant. It's a dark and foreboding place with as little light from the sun reaches this far. It lives in constant twilight, and the terrain tends to be cold forests filled with creatures that need neither light nor heat. It's normally associated with death and despair, though it's still full of life. The planet seems to sap the will of those who visit there, so few stay long. The planet that represents Saturn is the most conflicted, as it's either described as either black and obsessed with death, or vibrant blue and the color of sky. There doesn't seem to be any achieving a mutual version of the planet, so your options are call the planet Thanatos, and it's all about evil omens and death, or it's a yet-to-be-named blue world that is filled with sky creatures and air elementals. You'd think Thanatos would be reserved for Pluto, but as Mastara doesn't have a Pluto equivalent, I guess this is the closest thing. Irondol is the replacement for Neptune. It's a green gas giant that is held sacred to the elves. It is viewed as a good luck sign for diviners. The planet, of course, can't be landed on. It has no terrestrial locations, and the clouds are quite caustic and deadly. There are a large number of elemental creatures living in the clouds, but no one's been able to get close to them to ask them any meaningful questions. Ka is the last planet, representing Uranus. This is not a gas giant, but a land filled with rare and exotic creatures that Ka has saved from extinction, because he likes preserving things. Much like the Hollow World, it serves as a preserve for creatures brought to the brink. Unlike the Hollow World, the planet has no sentient life, just animal life of all types and sizes. Because of this, the animals have no fear of humans or other similar life. Arriving on the planet to grab rare creatures can become a rather dangerous expedition because of the countless predators. Now throw into the mix the planet Damocles, the fourth planet introduced in the Immortals box set. This planet is populated by powerful wizards and other arcane types who want to be left alone. At one point in the future, the planet is destined to explode, wiping out the population and forming an asteroid belt, as well as chunks of it becoming the equivalent of Mercury and Pluto. 
Little is known about Damocles, except for the fact they want to be left alone, and they defend their privacy fiercely. There's some speculation that this is the source of the Pyrithian pirates mentioned in the Voyage of the Princess arc, but those timelines don't match up, so chalk that one up to Mastara's continuity problems. Now for the biggest problem, the Beagle. Where Mastara was quite vague on its astronomy, Blackmore was quite specific. There's a galactic federation out there in Mastara space, with thousands of planets and solar systems and stars. That's canon. That also flies into the face of everything Spelljammer has written. In Spelljammer, everything is nice and neat, one solar system per crystal sphere, and everybody is happy. Blackmore Space has no spheres. Blackmore Space needs no spheres. So how do you resolve this problem? Not easily. One suggestion is Blackmore ships use some sort of FTL jump drive, similar to Battlestar Galactica. Instead of flying from A to B in linear space, it jumps from sphere to sphere without even moving much. This keeps the continuity and merges it with Spelljammer, but it does allow for a galaxy-spanning empire at the same time. They aren't seeing stars in their star charts, they're seeing crystal spheres, but they're not getting close enough to the spheres to realize that they're not stars. Mastara Space, to be totally fair, is a patchwork attempt by multiple authors to somehow combine all the conflicting information we have from other authors who are trying to merge incompatible universes, multiverses, and rule sets into a single coherent storyline. Nothing's official. Most of it has been retconned out or is just accepted fan fiction. Spelljammer was plagued with badly written rules and background trying to tie worlds together like Mastara, Dark Sun, and Eberron, but those settings and several others use entirely different rules which make it difficult to put them into a single Spelljammer universe. It's a decent effort to make it work, but it would require a complete rewrite of the Spelljammer setting to explain the rule differences that caused a majority of the conflicts. That wraps up Mastara Space. It's a mess of a subject for the reasons I mentioned. Most Spelljammer DMs are just going to have to wing it. Joining our list of topics is a big one, the Giants of Mastara. Or you can give the little guys a try that are still on the list. Remember to like and subscribe, and a big diok un farion to some Kimru fans for their little gift from the Hinulad. And a big FU for CenturyLink for somehow making my internet worse this weekend. But until then, it's really just a show, and you should really just relax.